Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Gareth Greenaway joins me. We're going to talk about QGIS, the geographical information software that helps you lay out maps and also analyze those maps. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Gareth Greenaway. Episode 270, recorded October 23rd, 2013. QGIS. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneEngine.com, bringing to you as often as I can, usually each week, but sometimes not quite every week, uh, the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the small projects, the projects in open source that you may be using every day, the projects you might not have ever heard of and would like to find more about. So uh, usually joining me, uh, well, almost always joining me is a co-host this week, and none exception to that would be uh, Gareth Greenaway. Gareth, welcome back to the show. Good morning, Randall. How are you? I'm uh, I'm I'm almost awake. It's a little tough still. I'm waiting for the caffeine to fully kick in. So uh, we'll see how this goes. We'll just see how it's how it's running. Uh, and uh, you're speaking to us from probably from Thousand Oaks, the usual spot. Again, yep, Thousand Oaks. Um, and I, kind of a dreary, gray day this morning. Un- it is un- a horrible California like. I, I can't imagine. This is not what I always picture Los Angeles to be like, but I'm staring out the window of the 13th floor of the uh, Howard Hughes building here, staring at the approaching airplanes coming down to LAX. And unfortunately, it is gray. It is very gray. I'm, you know, I'm from, a, I'm from Portland, Oregon. I'm still actually, I'm going back there actually tomorrow night to um, head back home for a while. And uh, I was, I, I was used to this gray stuff, but now that I've come here and it's been so many sunny days in a row, I just, I, the, the gray just really gets to me. It's like, ooh. But well, we, we actually have a quote of, of the number of days we have to have like a gray, dreary day or else the rest of the country gets jealous. <laughs> and you wouldn't want that to happen at all. Gray, exactly. Gray. Well, the show's not about travel logs. It's not about Los Angeles in particular. It, it's about open source. We have uh, always a wonderful guest to come on and talk about their projects. No, no exception again today. We have Tim Sutton, who's going to be represented representing, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to pronounce this, QGIS, QGIS, uh, QGIS, one of those. We'll have him, we'll have to ask him how to pronounce that. Um, it looks like it is graphic information software. So uh, being able to manage uh, oh, geographic. So geographic information software, being able to uh, represent maps and things, put data associated with the maps and drawing them. And apparently they just had a 2.0 release. So we'll have to talk about what's new with all this thing. Uh, do you, what do you know about QGIS? I know next to nothing about QGIS. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited to learn about it, though. Um, I had looked at, um, there's a project called OpenStreetMap um, a few years ago. But I had looked at um, that's related to mapping, like open source mapping software. Um, okay. But beyond that, I don't, uh, I don't have too much experience. But looking forward to hearing about it. Well, there we go. So rather than us chatting idly about what we don't know about QGIS, let's go ahead and bring on the expert about QGIS for our show today, Tim Sutton. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Nice to be here. Very cool. And where are you speaking to us from? I'm in a hotel room in Jakarta at the moment, but I actually live in South Africa, right near the southern tip of Africa, if you're geographically interested in those kind of things. So 100 k's from the tip. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and so uh, I, I sort of botched my way through describing what, well, first off, <laughs> how do you pronounce it? Is it QGIS? QGIS? What is it? Um, it's actually a bit of a contentious issue. There is no precise um, definition of how you should pronounce it. If you live in Germany, you, I think you say QGIS. And if you if you live in uh, some other places, you say QGIS. And uh, I, I like to say QGIS. So um and I think the Americans say QGIS or something like that. Spell it out. So. Okay. Well, well you say whatever how way you like. <laughs> whatever, whatever way it's pronounced, uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us sort of what the, the thirty thousand foot view, which is mm. also appropriate given that it's about graphical information or uh, geographic information. Um, uh, what what and what problem is uh, QGIS solving? So, um, in a nutshell, it's a, it's an application that you can use to create, edit, visualize, um, and um, 
uh, work with geographic information. So that's uh, like in its simplest form, that would be points, lines, and polygons that you could represent um, on a map and also um, f sort of aerial photogra uh, photography or some other kind of um, what's called raster data. So it's um, um, within the environment of QGIS, you can sort of load up those uh, different different layers of points, lines, and polygons, or say, for example, an aerial photograph, or it could be a terrain model or something like that, and then overlay them on top of each other, and then uh, change the symbology of those layers so that you can make your dots big and pink or green or, or uh, with a different symbol. And then... Um, and then you can um, also create data in, within the environment. So you, you've got digitizing tools. So if you ever used the GIMP or Inkscape or something like that, it, you can think of it like the same kind of environment as what the Inkscape might give you. Um, but um, all the, the data that you create is geographically referenced. Um, and then uh, you can also attach information to the spatial data. So that means that, um, uh, for example, you've got a point, you can attach information saying that this is uh, Cape Town or New York or whatever the name of the, whatever the, name of the point might be. Um, and whatever you can basically, you've got a little database attached to each um, uh, vector layer or point line and polygon layer. So um, you can store pretty much arbitrary data with each point. And then when you've got all that in, in the system, you can analyze it. You can do things like saying um, how many shops are within five kilometers of a certain location or show me all the roads which are of a uh, national road or um, motorway or something like that. So, um, and you can start to ask spatial questions of your data. And once you've done your analysis, then you can also, um, we've got a print composition environment where you can go um, use something like I guess similar to what you'd get in um, Scribus or a, or a desktop publishing kind of application where you can uh, lay out a page with a map on it and a legend and um, a scale bar and all the sort of traditional things that you'd put on a map and then you can make a PDF of it and um, send it to your boss and impress him <laughs> so that's the, the sort of two minute elevator pitch of it <laughs> That's really great, actually. There's a lot of things it can do. So let me let me start piecing some of these out. So within it, it must have then some sort of database of, like like say for the United States, it would have like the the geographic outline of all 50 states. Where does that data come from? Okay, so um, the we are basically the application that you use to open data sets. So you can think of it like um, you can use um, Open Office to open a, a, an Open Office document or, or a, a spreadsheet or whatever. So we're basically providing that sort of um, office application platform and then you've got to go and get hold of the data. And if you're in America, you're quite lucky. You, there are a lot of um, free data sources. So all your street um, data, I think all the elevation data, aerial photographs, um, pretty much anything you want, you can get from, I think, the USGS uh, website. If you're in uh, the rest of the world, then the OpenStreetMap project that um, Gareth mentioned um, earlier is um, is a good place to go. You can get you can sort of download it in a format digestible by QGIS and then um, give it your own color codes and what have you, um, sort of symbolize it to your own liking. Um, and then most countries, the governments uh, have some kind of um, GIS data set, which hopefully they publish and make free to everybody. That's what we obviously try to encourage, being open source guys and open data guys. Uh, many countries silo their data and they don't make it available. So, so OpenStreetMap is kind of like a, a grassroots way of getting that data in. And then you can also collect it yourself. You could take a GPS or something like that and just go and walk around your neighborhood and, and capture data and then bring it into QGIS. Um, or um, you can, we've also got sort of plugins that you could put like an, uh, a Google Maps backdrop and start digitizing um, on the top of uh, um, a map from Google Maps and capturing your own data. Um, so there's hundreds of ways to get the data in. Um, and... Um, yeah, and the, the other part of what you said is we must have a database. We, we actually have sort of drivers that you can fetch data from different data sources. So in the GIS world, the sort of ubiquitous format is something called a shapefile, which is a stupid name because it's actually a bunch of files. Um, <laughs> and um, it's, it's basically um, um, a, a kind of like a file-based database. You get a DBF file, which is, you know, like um, the old DBase 4 or 3, whichever version you, you might have used in the past. Um, and that's like the data table for, for the data. And then you get a, a like a, a shape file, the, like a SHP file, which has got the geometries in it. And you get a little file that sort of connects the, the, the database file and that together. And that's the sort of most commonly used data format, but there are also 
many other formats. So a GPX file from your GPS we can read. And um, uh, if you've uh, you did a, a show on Postgres a while back, there's actually a there's an extension to Postgres called PostGIS or PostGIS, which um, gives you spatial data um, storage capabilities in Postgres. And that's actually what we sort of normally recommend people use if you're doing anything more than a sort of a basic project. So you can actually load up all your data into Postgres and then QGIS can read it directly out of there and display it straight onto the map. Um, yeah. I, I, did, I actually, I want to caution our audience. Uh, I, I know you said, you know, load up Google Maps, then draw on top yeah. of that, but yeah. that's actually a, a violation of their copyright, so you need to be careful yeah. not to do that. Yeah. Okay, just, just, is, just yeah. to, so I don't get people <laughs> in trouble here for listening to the show, so there we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, I, I remember can, I was doing some work with OpenStreetMap, yeah. and they were very careful to say not to yes. do that, because that would be driving data from Google, and that would be actually yeah. uh, hurting OpenStreetMap to do that. Yeah. yeah. I don't encourage or condone it, but you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. We, 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 we make it possible. We just don't say it's necessarily legal. That's yeah. good. Well, I guess in some parts of the world it might be okay, but uh, no, I don't want to don't do that. Okay, so I've got, I'm getting my data from some GIS source. Um, I think in the U.S. also the street information comes from... Uh, I think they're Tiger. called the Tiger Tiger database. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've got my information coming in there, and then I have some data that must be related to that. And mm -hmm. then, so what, one of the next steps might be to, uh, you know, highlight that data associated with different, say, geographic regions. And then, uh, so the output of that is a PDF, or output of that is like stuff I screen capture. Or wh where does it go from there? So um, what, what you do in QGIS is you, you create a project, which is just a collection of different layers, of thematic layers that you would load in. So you might load the streets layer, and then you might load a buildings layer, you might load um, some points of interest where the nearest Burger King is or what have you. And then um, you sort of combine them all together and you, and you create a map like a, a map project in QGIS and you can mm -hmm. save that project file and um, then sort of open it again later. And then um, you... Um, you, you can take that and then produce a, a, a printout. Uh, you, you basically compose it in our map composer, and you can have more than one printout. So you could have an A0 printout and A4 and different sizes or different um, map elements on them, different labels and so on. Mm. Um, and then um, you, you sort of pass that on to somebody if you want to. Although I'm, I'm, I must say like the... the the intent of GIS is not really just printing maps. It's really about the analysis. So it's it's a platform that you can do spatial analysis. So um, you you get all those layers into your project. You you start to ask questions like spatial questions about your data. Like um, if there was a flood um, in this river, how many buildings might be affected, for example? Mm -hmm. And then you could uh, sort of uh, model it and and select all the buildings. Um, for example, based on a hundred meter buffer around the river, and then see actually okay those buildings might be affected. Then you might take those and do some um, like cost analysis. So like give me the total, the sum of all the selected buildings and you know, what does that equal in monetary value and so on. So the intent is really to provide a spatial analysis platform and you know, printing a map is just a vehicle for presenting the results of your analysis. Um, um, and, I, and I guess that's where we sort of diverge from Google Maps or Google um, Earth or one of these sort of, um, sort of uh, mainstream um, map viewing platforms is re really those are just about visualization and um, we're about you know providing an analysis platform and we've got a huge number of different tools in QGIS that you can use to um, analyze your data and we've also got a plugin architecture so if the, what we ship with QGIS isn't enough you can download uh, you know, from our plugin repository different kind of plugins that you do all different things so um, you know the the, the Plugins range incredibly in in, in their um, scope. So, I mean, for example, uh, one of our uh, one of our communities written a time series plugin, so you can uh, um, load some data that's got timestamps associated with it. Say, for example, um, people's location over time, and then you can sort of play it back like a like a movie almost, and see how people moved um, through uh, through your city um, during time. She actually did she did a nice little demo using um, Twitter. Um, uh, the geo feed from Twitter, and then you could see where people are tweeting from, uh, you know, over a certain amount of time or what have you. Um, so it's really an analysis platform, and the you know the printing is just the vehicle for producing um, the result of your analysis in a format that somebody can digest. Cool. Um, um, and so, 
What's the history of the project? How did it all get started? Mm. So um, I should explain a little bit of backstory that we, we're operating in a space somewhat equivalent to like um, uh, LibreOffice operates in the same space as um, Microsoft Office and, and uh, I guess they don't really have any competition anymore, but, you know, products, you know, sort of productivity software. We're operating in a space where um, there are a couple of big vendors that produce very expensive um, uh, desktop GIS applications um, that kind of do what we do and maybe a bit more. Um, and um, when I say very expensive, I, th I don't know the prices exactly, but we're sort of talking like twenty thousand dollars for a, you know, for the, the the standard desktop package or something like that from the main proprietary vendor. So, um, uh, eleven years ago, the founder of QGIS, which is not myself, and the founder is Gary Sherman, who lives in a, I always like to say in the in the, the wastelands of Alaska somewhere. I think he actually lives in Anchorage, but <laughs> it always seems like a dark and lonely <laughs> icy wasteland from. Uh, from the pictures he sends, but um, he, he was basically trying to just view um, some geospatial data in, um, uh, on his open source Linux-based desktop, and um, there, you know there wasn't any program to do that. You know, the typical things so he wanted to scratch his own niche. He just built a simple little little viewer application that could connect to PostGIS because PostGIS and Postgres have been around you know for the last 11 years, so you could you could already store your data in a geospatial database, but there wasn't any real good way to view it. Um, and he built this little um, application and he put it onto Freshmeet. I don't know if you, I don't know if Freshmeet still is very popular, but it was in those days it was still popular. And, and I was, you know, watching always Freshmeet to see what kind of cool things were coming out. And um, myself and a few others noticed it and we sort of got on board on um, the project. And so in the beginning it was very small, very informal. The, 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 the first version of the software uh, was very limited. I mean, you could basically load some, load some data from Postgres and Pan and Zoom and sort of... Um, do some very basic things and um, change some colors of lines and things. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's the normal story of open source. Other people saw this, uh, saw the utility of it and started to add um, new features and so on. Myself, I mean, I came along to the project. I, I was already a GIS practitioner and, and uh, an open source um, f free software sort of convert. And um, I'd come from a background where, you know, we... we um, I was actually working in a nature conservation agency in, in South Africa. I was my, my training is actually nature conservation, not GIS or software programming. But um, you know, we we wanted to use um, GIS to you know manage nature reserves, manage biodiversity, and so on. And and the software was incredibly expensive. We we did actually get a grant from the proprietary vendor, but I, you know I really saw that there was no future in um, you know like making this kind of spatial analysis tool um, open to the general public or making it pervasive. And, uh, you know, a lot of other people, I think, saw the same thing, that we're just basically operating in a in a playing field where there's no, there's nothing for, um, you know, between the person who can spend $20,000 on a piece of software and, and the, you know, if you just go on the street, there's, there's nothing. So, um, so I think that's incentivized a lot of people to start to work um, on QGIS and, um, so, um, you know, I think after seven, um, eight years, we, we released version one. So it was quite a long time coming to make a first version of, of QGIS. And we had a lot of sort of zero point something releases in the, in the run up to that. Um, but, but the sort of version one was um, really the intent was just to have a very capable GIS data browser. And we didn't really focus very much on the analysis side of things at all. And um, in the time that we, we were building that version one, we, we, we gathered a lot of um, of in, in sort of enthusiastic developers in the project, and then um, subsequent to that, we started you know really trying to um, improve the the offering that we had a lot, and we we put in a lot of um, analytical functionality, but also some really uh, great tools for um, for producing great looking maps and so on. Um, and uh, you know, up to the point where in, in September now um, this year we we launched version two, which is a huge you know step again, step forward again um, over version one that we had. And um, again, we had various one point something releases along the way to that. And um, yeah, so it's it's a grassroots project. There's no um, there's no big company that decided to start it and just hand over the source code or something like actually LibreOffice, you know came from, uh, what was it, Star Office or something before that. And we were just basically started from the most basic um, functionality and just built onto it. Um, yeah. Just to clarify, was that electrical mm. functionality or electoral functionality? 
Um, sorry, I didn't. In which context? No, I. Well, you you were just talking about some of the features that you you added. We were we were just curious if it was electrical uh, functionality or electoral uh, functionality. I think I said analytical. Sorry. Oh, analytical. <laughs> it's my <Okay>. South African accent. <laughs> no worries. No worries. An um, analytical so, functionality. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it makes more sense. Um, so you you kind of mentioned that there are quite a few um, products projects. Um, in the kind of GIS space, mm. what are kind of some of your your major um, competitors? I guess um, both both commercial and um, kind of open source. Yeah. So, well, in the in the commercial space, the the main sort of uh, flagship product is um, is called ArcGIS, which is by a company called ESRI or Esri, um, which is um, a multi billion dollar company, and they've basically been in the GIS game, I, I guess, for 25, 30 years. I'm not exactly sure how long they've been doing it. Um, and then there are a couple of other sort of fairly big proprietary vendors, um, but um, by, by far the most dominant is, is um, ESRI. Um, and then on the open source side, there are actually many, many uh, um, um, sort of GIS or um, geospatial related open source projects now. When I started out sort of 11 years ago looking at these things, there were actually only a handful of them. But um, especially in the last five years, there's just really been booming. And I think part of that is because of the uh, the sort of sudden availability of geospatially referenced information, like you can get Twitter feeds, you can get your photos georeferenced off, you know, your camera. Everything's suddenly got you know, geospatial uh, content related to it and people want obviously to be able to visualize that. So the so we don't really, add, I mean, we, I guess we have some competition in open source, but we kind of think of it more as co-opetition. So um, we, we um, there's another uh, very um, venerable GIS package called GRASS, which was actually a, a US military um, project originally, I believe, and they donated to um, into the public domain 30 years ago. So it's actually very, you know, one of the, probably the older um, open source projects out there. Um, and um, and then there is a post GIS which I mentioned, which is you know the data store, and there is um, there are a couple of other desktop um, uh, offerings which sort of um, uh, do kind of similar things to QGIS. Of course, I'm biased, but I think QGIS is the best of them out there. <laughs> and um, and then there are also now in the you know in the more recent years there are a lot of web um, applications which are starting to sort of provide uh, to some extent the same functionality as what desktop um, applications like QGIS are doing. So um, there's open layers, there's leaflet, and there, um, um, there are a whole bunch of other sort of open source um, uh, sort of web mapping environments. Okay. Um, currently, what license is uh, QGIS licensed under? Um, we're under GPL2 and um, two or greater actually and uh, we, there's been some talk about switching to GPL version 3 but um, I think we're all sort of, well I, speaking for myself more, I'm, I'm very license uh, idiotic, I'm, I'm happy with the GPL 2 and I haven't really got any strong uh, desire to change it to something else but um, yeah so it's all under GPL 2 so you can um, you can use it, but you must give back your your changes to the community. And we sort of uh, we had a few discussions about using, for example, LGP, LGPL because some people want to build proprietary extensions to to QGIS via plugins or what have you. But we sort of kind of feel that we want people to contribute back, so we don't really want to create a platform that discourages uh, or, or makes it easy for people to not um, contribute back to to QGIS. Okay. Um do you, what what platforms does QGIS currently run on? Like, if I wanted to to get started using it, what are my what are my my, my platform options? Uh, I should actually probably try and answer it by telling you which ones it doesn't on because <laughs> run on because it pretty much runs on it runs on Mac, runs on Linux, runs on Windows. Um, there's a, there's um, an Android port for it, so you can run it on Android. You can't run it on uh, iOS or the you know the uh, iPhone. Um, and people have ported it to BSD, and um, so pretty pretty much will run on anything that you can compile, uh, Qt and and other libraries that we require on. Are there plans to have a port available for iOS, or is it kind of the the, the lack of Qt or Qt um, the hurt? 
Um, so in uh, Qt5, which we're supporting still Qt4, Qt5, um, I believe you can, you know, there's a, there's a port for iOS. So the possibility is there that once uh, we switch to Qt5, we'd be able to run on iOS. Um, but there's nobody actively working on that at the moment. But uh, I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility for us to do that. Okay. Um, what's the most interesting thing you've seen someone do with, with QGIS? Uh, I could give a long list, but let me sort of cherry pick a couple. I, I, had, I often get sort of random emails from people writing um, to me, asking me things or telling me about things they're doing with QGIS. So, I mean, I, I got... Um, one from some people in Ethiopia doing subsistence farming using QGIS to help them plan their plan their um, you know the crop production and so on. Uh, there's somebody in South Africa who's doing uh, recording all their the game counts for in game reserves with QGIS, and then they can sort of monitor um, animal populations and the movements of animals. Um, some of the really uh, interesting things that are happening in Switzerland, which actually there's a there's a strong core of um, developer and community. Um, uh, activity in, in Switzerland um, and some of our earliest developers come from Switzerland and basically what, what um, happens is a lot of uh, your, your town council probably uses ESRI products and, and most people's town councils do. A lot of the Swiss councils were using ESRI products and they sort of realized that well for the amount of money that they're spending every year um, by the way, I think that's twenty thousand dollars that I mentioned. I, I'm not sure if that's a yearly cost or if it's a once-off cost, but I know that there's some sort of yearly maintenance fee that they charge. They've kind of figured out that for the money that they're spending on ESRI products, they could kind of take half of it and um, put it in, the, keep it in the bank, and spend the other half on on paying fee, uh, people to add the features they need to QGIS. And um, so there are quite a few. Um, administrations in Switzerland and all around the world, but particularly in Switzerland, that are running their, you know, running their towns on QGIS. So all the um, the, the city infrastructure, the gas mains, the uh, wastewater, the um, road plans, the uh, zonal planning, everything that they they got in QGIS, and they can do all, you know, you know, query the query the infrastructure and um, use it to help to manage the infrastructure. Um, and then, really, I mean, just. The list just goes on and on. So people do every facet of um, of work, from like traffic management to um, w uh, water management. To um, I got a message from a guy, still so an email reply. From, he wants to climb every highest peak in South America that's above um, I forget what the, the altitude was, and he's like looking to use QGIS to you know identify the highest peaks. I mean, so you can just pretty much use it for any any spatial question that you might have to um, to ask. Hmm, interesting. I, I'm especially interested in the fact that um, that government was using um, QGIS and actually funding and funding development. That's that's always good to see. Hmm. Um, so we had a question from the IRC channel. Um, does QGIS have a data repository for mappings that users can access? Um, we don't really. We're not in the sort of making the data available um, business, but. Um, we have repositories of plugins and, and sort of add-ons for QGIS, but for the data side of things, we um, we support a number of different protocols that allow you to access online data repositories. So, I mean, the, the whole GIS field is quite vast, but within GIS, there is a there is an open um, data protocol um, sort of arena, which covers um, protocols that allow you to connect to a web service. And there are a number of these different web services. So there's a, a web coverage service where, which allows you to fetch sort of um, rasterized data. There's a web feature service that allows you to fetch points, lines, and polygons. Um, and there's a web uh, mapping service which allows you to fetch pre-rendered maps. And um, again, most governments, most city councils, um, um, many uh, independent organizations publish their GIS data via these protocols. So if you know what the address of the portal is or you just do a Google search for WMS or WFS, WCS, you'll find um, you know long lists of these, these data portals and you can basically connect uh, to them straight from QGIS and sort of consume the data within QGIS. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then we've also got, like I said, we've got compatibility with OpenStreetMap data. So you can, the, probably the easiest way to get started getting data is um, is uh, going along to uh, like one of these uh, OpenStreetMap extraction services. Uh, the one that I sort of use is called cloudmade.com, C 
cloudmade.com. Um, and um, uh, they, they'll provide you, like, you can just, uh, they've broken up the world by country and then by uh, regions within countries, and you can just dig down to the level you want, and they'll provide you the shape files that come from, uh, from OpenStreetMap, which you can just download and use in your desktop. Okay. Um, currently, what, um, yeah, shift uh, gears a bit, what, uh, what libraries does, was QGIS currently utilize um, for its use? Mm -hmm. So I mentioned we use Qt, Qt 4 at the moment. We actually, I think we started, I can't remember if we started on Qt 2. I think we started on, uh, anyway, the, the majority of our life we were on Qt 3 or 4, and I guess at some point we'll switch to Qt 5. And that um, Qt, we're using it sort of both the user interface level, but we also quite heavily use the Qt core libraries for um, things like string representation. By, by the way, Qt uh, just has written in sort of 90% uh, in C++ and, and the other 10% in Python. And um, so we use that for the sort of upper level where, you, where you've got your graphical user interface and then also for um, doing things like uh, network access and data I.O. and so on. But then um, we sort of, uh, the, we use a whole bunch of different open source geospatial libraries. So the, probably the, one of the key ones is um, called GDL or G-D-A-L, GDL. Um, the author pronounces it Goodle. Um, and GDAL is kind of like, it actually stands for Generic Data Abstraction Library. So it's a kind of like um, a middleware between all different sorts of data um, uh, formats. And um, uh, you can basically use it to read in, for example, a shapefile or a comma-separated values file or a, a KML file from you know, Google Earth um, format file. Um, and hundreds of other formats, both in rasterized data and in vectorized data. And so we, we, we sort of extend, uh, the, well, we use GDAL so that we can read in all these different formats. And then um, we also use like libpg, libpq, uh, the Postgres library, so that we can talk directly to Postgres. Um, we just got Oracle support, so I think you need to have the proprietary um, uh, Oracle drivers on your system or something, and then you can connect to to um, Oracle and same for MS SQL Server and um, uh, uh, SQL any uh, I think it's called SQL Anywhere Spatial Light. So ba basically, all of those different um, data sources that we support, we have you know either the open source library or in some cases you need to have the the proprietary library on your system. Obviously, we we don't ship them because that's not compatible with the GPL. Um, and um, and then um, there are also sort of a bunch of other libraries for sort of uh, dealing with geometry operations. So there's a library called Geos, which allows you to do things like uh, what is the intersection between two polygons or is this point within this polygon or does this line touch this point and so on. So you can do all this kind of spatial, uh, spatial operations. Um, so there's, yeah, there's quite a lot of different libraries that we use. Um, and then, um, you know, we've also got... Uh, as well as the desktop application that we provide, we've also got um, uh, a QGIS server application, um, which is kind of built off the same code base and then that uses uh, uh, um, CGI libraries. And um, so it's actually really, uh, uh, we really try to benefit as much as possible from all these other open source projects out there that have built, you know, um, sort of single purpose libraries and incorporate them as much as possible so we didn't have to rewrite everything from first principles. Excellent. Um, so one of the things that you had mentioned in kind of your your um, the notes that you'd sent over to us um, was a project mm -hmm. called InnaSafe. I was wondering if you could speak a bit about that. Sure. So um, so InnaSafe is a is a disaster contingency planning tool that um, like in my day job I work on. So uh, you just for. In the beginning for me, it was just a volunteer hobby project and um, for many others, but many of us are now sort of making our money by doing consulting services around QGIS. And so um, uh, the reason I'm here in Jakarta in a hotel at the moment is because I'm, I'm working on um, InnerSafe. And basically what the, the tool does is it allows you to do um, uh, like planning for disasters. So, if, for example, there's a, there's a flood. We want to know how many buildings might be affected or how many um, people might be affected or if there's an earthquake. Um, again, how many people or buildings might be affected or 
for volcanoes and so on. And also to answer questions like, okay, if we evacuate 30,000 people, um, you know, how, many, how much food do we need to have for them? How much water do we need to have them, for them? Um, um, sort of what are the, the sort of living requirements for those people? And um, we try to sort of make, uh, in Inner Safe, we try to make everything in a sort of uh, uh, easily digestible format so that um uh, you know, does people when there's a disaster, you don't have time to to sort of monkey around trying to do the actual, you know, the the raw analysis for for these kind of things. So we try to make it very simple user interface based on QGIS, um, which allows you to just answer a question sort of in the event of something, how many something would be affected, and um, and so then you sort of load in some layers. You might load in a population layer and a buildings layer and a flood layer or what have you, and then you s sort of can ask this this question and um, it will sort of produce a PDF uh, report for you. Um, it's a really awesome project because it's all, um, it's all sponsored by, um, well, there's actually various sponsors. There's um, the Aust Australian aid agency in Indonesia. Oh, they've got a, they've got a group here called um, um, AIFDR, which is um, Australian Indonesian facility for D disaster reduction. And they um, and also the World Bank has been, you know, sponsoring this project. And, um, and um, you know, they, they basically really get open source. Everything is, is built, um, you know, is, is published under open license. The source code is all on GitHub and, um, um, and they care about code quality and we've got a lot of unit tests and so on. And it's really, um, uh, uh, you know, a great platform. Uh, great to have QGIS as a platform that we can go to people um, uh, like this and say to them, you know, look, you can use a free software, you can take the software and give it to every disaster manager out there in the field. It won't, you know, other than the development cost, it's not going to cost you anything to to um, to provide them the software. And, um, and uh, yeah, so I've been working on the project for the last year and almost two years now, and it's been really great, uh, great ride. Uh, we actually won the, we won the Black Duck, Black Duck, Top ten rookie of the year award um, this year for um, for our, for the work we did last year, which is Black Duck is the the, the company that makes um, the Olo website. I don't know if you've used that before, which is where you sort of uh, can go and see various metrics about how your open source project is doing, and they select from from the all the I think they got I don't know hundreds of thousands of projects on their on their database and they select from that um, you know 10 projects every year to to showcase so it was quite a nice uh, patch on the back for the project it's a, it's actually a pretty nice award to have gotten for your organization um, or for the new new project I mean um, mm -hmm. what you mentioned earlier that you're a consumer of open street map data um, mm -hmm. do you also find that QGIS is being used to uh, help enhance the OpenStreetMap data? Yeah, so op OpenStreetMap actually have their own sort of um, set of tools. Um, they've got Potlatch and they've got a new one whose name I forget, which are sort of um, uh, web-based um, uh, mm -hmm. tools for, for creating the data. And they've also got another one called Jossum. Um, and they're quite specialized because the, the data format of OpenStreetMap is kind of... Um, uh, a little bit strange in the in the in, in the GIS world in that they've got like um, a very loose schema, so you can kind of put anything about anything uh, into the database. Which you know, mm. in, in traditional GIS databases, we tend to be more like formal schema orientated. So um, we want to, you to define the the domain before you start putting um, data into it. Um, mm. But so we, we've got some tools that um, allow you to edit the data, but uh, honestly, you're probably better off using um, Jossum or one of their dedicated tools if you're wanting to do any serious work on OpenStreetMap. Um, but um, a lot of people prepare data in tools like QGIS and put them in a shape file and, uh, shape file and then send them to like the OSM project and say, here you go, and they sort of will run an import script or something to, to, to batch load it. But if you're trying to like, you know, digitize your town streets one at a time using QGIS, it's probably not the best choice for doing that. You'd probably be better off with, with Jossum or, or one of their, you know, their specific tools for it. Okay, and how is how is the project organized? How many core developers are there, and how do you keep in touch? So, um, for many years, we've been a pure virtual product a project, and um, 
But um, you know, as the project's grown, we've we've sort of formalised a lot. So we've got a project steering committee. There's um, uh, six of us on the are we six. Yeah, I think six of us on the project steering committee. <laughs> um, actually, seven of us. We just added a couple more guys to the project, um, and um, and then under the steering committee, like each person in the steering committee basically has a remit. So um, we've got you know a documentation team. We've got uh, sort of marketing and, and finance team. We've got a code maintenance team. And um, and um, within the project as a whole, we've got 29 core developers. Those are people with direct GitHub, you know, write permissions. Mm -hmm. And then we've had um, 179 sort of contributors. Those are people that have sent um, like some kind of um, trackable patch, you know, something that we can actually um, sort of Rip their name out of if we if we if we go through the source code, but we've also had you know hundreds of thousands of other sort of flyby, drive past um, patches given to us by pe by people who sort of just do a once off thing and then disappear again, um, and so we've got you know a very active developer community and we try to when people join the project we try to get them uh, or when they sort of get given core developer rights we try to get them to you know, take on the maintainership of a particular part of the code base because the code base has is, is become quite complex and large over over time. So um, we'll say, you know, welcome to the club now. Will you please look after <laughs> X, Y, Z bit of code or, or library mm -hmm. or whatever you within the code base. And um, um, but beyond the developers, we actually, there's a huge community of, of people that are doing sort of non-development work. So we've got a, like I said, we've got a documentation team and we've got a full, I, I don't know how many hundred pages, but they've got a very detailed a manual for QGIS. And then um, uh, we've got uh, like like teams doing, building the website and um, managing our infrastructure. We've got um, we've got very active mailing lists, and there's a lot of people that just sort of hang around um, answering questions on the mailing list. And uh, we're also on, uh, I guess you know the G the Stack Exchange website. Well, there's a gis.stackexchange.org or com. I forget what it is, um, which is the the sort of the forum platform that we use. And again, we're pretty active there, and we've got very active members from our community that hang out there and help people. Um, so, but but it's all grassroots pretty much. We, there's no there's no um, uh, sort of big organisation that runs the project, and and um, we the project steering committee is really there just to um, arbitrate if there are any sort of decisions that need to be made, like for example how to spend the donation money that we receive, um, or uh, if we want to take some strategic decision, we'll we'll take it to the PSC, but. We're pretty much, um, you know, meritocracy. When people arrive to the project. They've if they've got skills and a thing, and they can demonstrate them. We we pretty much give them their their head to go ahead and you know get busy and do stuff. And um, the models worked really well. I mean, we, we just get the most um, awesome things being added to the code base all the time. People just arrive out of nowhere and say, "Here's some cool stuff," and um, and um, it's sort of being a little bit free really helps um, the creativity and let people um, uh, make it easy for people to to contribute. Um, yeah. And, and so it sounded like you've got a lot of things going on, and you've talked a couple times about donations and about organizations paying the QGIS mm -hmm. project to be able to replace proprietary stuff with it. What's what's mm -hmm. the financial model like? Is it is it is it is it Funded entirely, or is it a labor of love for a lot of people, or or, what, or something in between? So it's um, I don't know what the split is between people that just do it for for the love of it, um, and people that are now being paid to work on QGIS, and um, then you know as a result of the, the, for example, a client might approach me and say, um, well, we had a case um, last year with with the World Bank. The, the client said we want to make some improvements to the to the map composition software. And then uh, you know I would say okay yeah that's great we can do it but we you know obviously we're going to put it back into QGIS and they they're fine with that and then we would do some work on a contract basis for them and uh, donate the code back into QGIS and um, we try to sort of obviously guide people to to do that as much as possible we, you know from the project side we we um, we want you know cross cutting features things that have got a broad um, um, uh, usability or you know a lot of people would want to use that so if somebody comes with a 
I don't know, some esoteric plugin that counts the number of um, frogs around their pond and their garden or something. We're probably not going to include it in the core of the project, but anything that's, you know, sort of generically interesting, we'll, we'll sort of accept into the project and that is likely to be maintained. Um, so, um, and then we, a couple of years back, we also started a sponsorship program. So we've, we've got a couple of sponsors and, um, um, and, Basically, we, we say, you, you know, we, we'd love to have you to sponsor the project, but it's not going to give you, um, like, uh, decision-making power in the project. So we reserve the right to uh, decide, firstly, how to spend the money you donate. Um, and then also, you know, we're not going to plaster your logo all over the front of, <laughs> of the software when it starts up or something like that. We try to keep it pretty vanilla so that um, mm -hmm. it doesn't look like it's, uh, you know, coming from, uh, um, I don't know, Pizza Hut or something like that, and um, and um, yeah, and so but but I mean I, I think the the a very large part of what's in QGIS as you see it and run it on your desktop is just um, people doing a labor of love and donating their 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 time and effort into the project and um, making it available to everybody. Um, we'd love, of course, to have a lot of sponsors and uh, help us fund our activities. I mean, the main things that we, we fund are every every six months we have a developer meeting, usually somewhere in Europe because the majority of our developers are in Europe and um, we get together in a in a room, eat a lot of pizza and, um, and hack for three days at a time and to sort of do the strategic thinking for the project and then go off and carry on working. Uh, we've got an IRC channel, which is um, hash QGIS on irc.freenode.net and um, most of the collaborations via the IRC channel or via mailing list, um, our developer mailing list. So, um, yeah, so it's a very grassroots project. I mean, we, we are still hoping one day that some, I don't know, insanely rich person comes and dollops, of, you know, millions of dollars into our bank account, whatever. I mean, I guess every open source project is waiting for that. <laughs> but um, yeah. in the meantime, we sort of muddle on in our own way and... Um, and uh, but but the sort of uh, the contract based support that we're getting is really uh, it's picking up a lot as people as a, you know it's sort of a self perpetuating thing as a, as as more and more improvements get put into the code base and becomes more and more viable for more and more organisations then they see fit to sponsor more people to add more features that they need and so on and so it's sort of uh, it's, it's like a snowball effect. Cool. Hey. Um. Um. So what. Um. um Act silly! I lost the question I was going to ask. Darn it! Um, so, who, so who decides then? It's the program steering committee, right? That decides sort of where the future mm. is going with this, right? Yeah. Um, but it's like I said, it's very, very um, merit based. I mean, we we are very uh, light touch on this on the steering wheel. So, I mean, basically, if somebody's the maintainer of a given piece of code and they think they, in, you know, they've got a good idea, or they normally just go ahead and implement it unless it's, you know, uh, unless it's really something cross-cutting, like, for example, let's port to Qt5 or something like that. We, you know, we pretty much let people go ahead and do their own thing and then we'll, you know, big decisions like that we'll we'll take as a group, you know. So, and usually, that, like, let's port to Qt5 is, uh, well, it's going to be 10 years before Debian, <laughs> Debian has it <laughs> in their um, in their repositories, so let's wait or something, you know, something along those lines. And given how internationally it seems to be used, has it been translated into a lot of different languages, internationalized? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I've lost track, but um, I think there's probably 25 languages that have been fairly decently translated and then many others that are sort of, you know, got fledgling translation. Um, so, you know, sort of 10% or 15% or something like that. But um, there is sort of probably at least uh, eight of those languages are 100% uh, translated, you know. So if you speak German or Portuguese or um, uh, I think Dutch or um, Russian, whatever, you're in, you're in good shape for using it in your native interface, uh, in your native language. Um, and we've got sponsorship to translate to, uh, to Indonesian as well, even the work we're doing here. And, um, and it's all using Qt's, uh, uh, Qt, Qt Linguist. So we've been playing around with, uh, with Transifex. I've, I listened with interest to the various translation projects you guys have been uh, in, uh, interviewing. Um, but uh, uh, primarily we use, we've been using Qt Linguist, which is a sort of desktop app um, from Qt for doing translations. Uh, yeah, and also the, the manuals and the documentation is translated and uh, the website is translated. And um, so uh, we're very sort of uh, 
uh, international or multinational uh, location friendly and uh, actually one of the things people like about QGIS is they can load up their Chinese data set and sort of actually it will work in QGIS because some of the proprietary software just can't handle uh, you know these various different character encodings that people use and so on. Cool. Um, we're almost out of time. Uh, is there anything that we haven't talked about yet that you want to make sure our audience is aware of? Well, I guess I should just mention the, the website is qgis.org, and uh, you can see it, I guess, on my lower third there. And um, we're a uh, we're very welcoming community. I think uh, I think we're quite proud of the fact that we're probably one of the friendliest open source communities out there. We I, th I don't think we've ever had a, like a flame war or something like that. And we're very um, understanding of people coming come along and not really understanding the the domain that we're working in and want to just get started. So we welcome anybody to come along and sort of use QGIS as a platform to start learning about geospatial data. And uh, we're, we're always looking for new developers. So, um, uh, and that's not only developers like in the, in the desktop application, but people who've got web development skills or uh, people who like to do very low level sort of data um, pro pro processing and so on. Um, and we're always looking for translators and document writers and people to fix bugs and just even manage the bug queue and so on. So, um, yeah, so come along and uh, check us out. Also, if you if you actually want to get a flavor for what you can do, there, we've got a Flickr pool in um, the Flickr community. Um, I think if you just search for, for QGIS on Flickr in the communities section, there's a screenshot section and an example map printout section, and you can really get an idea of the kind of things that you can produce. So, um yeah, come along and join in and uh, have some fun with, with maps. Very cool, very cool. I've got to ask my two required questions now or else mm. some of my <laughs> audience members are going to yell at me. So uh, what's your uh, favorite scripting language? So you're probably going to yell at me too. <laughs> my favorite scripting language is Python. And then cool. dashes are close. <laughs> so can, but, that's um, fine, that's fine. Uh, you know, you use whatever works. <laughs> I always tell people that. I, I'm more familiar with it with yeah. Perl than anything else, but that's yeah. uh, that's because that's, I started early with Perl, like half my life, I said, as I said yeah. before. And uh, <laughs> I'm probably not, not going to like your favorite text editor either, right, am I? No. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a long, long time Vim user, and um, <sighs> I've actually just just been switched uh, in the last two years I've started using IDEs which is like very progressive of me and I've been using PyCharm a lot with its Vim emulation mode so I'm still kind of using Vim but in a fancy GUI so but yeah I love Vim. <laughs> okay very good very good so uh, <laughs> I want to thank you for coming on the show and talking to us it's about QGIS and uh, and uh, hopefully informing a number of people that might not know about it before now they'll know because they'll have listened to this show. Great thanks for having me on. Very good. That was Tim Sutton, one of the key representatives for us from the QGIS project. What do you think, Gareth? Uh, very cool stuff. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I have one of those frogs that was on the map in my throat. Um, yeah, no, very, very exciting. Um, I, I mean, I could see like tons of, of applications where this could uh, yeah, definitely be used. Well, I like the idea that it was more than just mapping software. There was actually also analysis software because, you know, to get that stuff correct is difficult. And I'm glad there's a nice open source package for all that. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool, too. So we'll see. Um, and hopefully some of our audience members, if they weren't aware of it already, will be able to be able to use QGIS for whatever application they might have. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, like I said, I like the, uh, the, the Innisafe. Um, project that he he mentioned, just being mm -hmm. able to kind of plan that stuff out ahead of time and know well before a disaster what you need to do. Um, it, it's great to see like an open source project doing something like that. Cool. Well, speaking of open source projects, we still have a few more projects scheduled between now and the end of the year. Uh, we've got the uh, next week coming up, the OpenSUSE Summit. Uh, OpenSUSE, we've had them on the show before, and now apparently they have a conference that they are doing. I forgot to ask him if there are conferences for QGIS, but I imagine it's just part of other GIS conferences instead. Um, Following that, we have G Potter, which is a podcast manager. Some of you, in fact, may be listening to this show, this very show, using your G Potter application. Uh, RDO, which is the OpenStack Community Edition. So RDO is Red Hat 
something O for OpenStack. I don't know what the letters stand for. Anyway, it's one of those. And then um, uh, rounding out the schedule so far is Crossroads, which is a fork of ZeroMQ. We had Peter Hinges talking about ZeroMQ. We'll have the explanation for why that got forked by the person who forked it coming on to that. I still have a few open slots left in Q4. If you go to twit.tv slash floss, you can actually see our spreadsheet link from there. And it, well, I'm still trying to fill those in before I have to leave on all my multiple cruises I'm taking between now and the end of the year. Um, and I'll also be opening up Q1 immediately after that. Uh, you can follow us on Floss Weekly at uh, Google+. Plus. Follow us on Google Plus at Floss Weekly. How about if I get the words in the right order today? Uh, Floss Weekly also on Twitter. Uh, we post there as well. Uh, we do have a live chat. As we said, we took a couple questions from there today. That's at uh, live.twit.tv at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays, usually. Uh, you can follow me at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter. But I'm more frequently speaking on Google Plus at Randall L. Schwartz. So you can follow me there. I have great discussions about uh, open source stuff. I have discussions about uh, uh, my low-carb, high-fat ketogenic diet. I have also discussions about uh, just humorous things. I send this post two or three humorous things at Arrow's Day. Um, and uh, this is the last time you'll see me posting or, or posting from this particular location. Uh, the, the NAMI Media has been a great client of mine for about a year. And uh, they're, they're, uh, they're winding me up. Winding, winding me up. They're winding up with me. There we go. Uh, my words are not coming today. My words are all in the wrong order today. Um, but uh, I am looking for work. I'm, you know, I do Perl. I do DevOps. I do uh, uh, technical writing, all sorts of things. Uh, I won't be available until after the first of the year. Uh, because I have, like I said, three cruises coming up, so I'll be all tied up all over the international uh, planet here. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm looking for more work, uh, preferably in Southern California, but I'll go anywhere in the U.S. that I can get a plane ticket to. So that's all I have to plug today. What do you have to plug, Gareth? I think you can safely guess. <laughs> uh, something about SoCal Linux Expo, I bet. Something, Yeah, something about that. Um, so, yeah, SoCal Linux Expo uh, is coming up in February, February uh, 20th through the 22nd. I should really look up those dates just so I have the accurate <laughs> information one of these days. Um, anyway, but it's all on the website, SoCalLinuxExpo.org. Uh, so our registration is now open as well as our call for papers. Um, so, yeah, it's a great show. If anyone's interested in coming out and speaking, and we have all the information on the website. So, yeah. You know, I should say, is there a discount for uh, Floss Weekly listeners for the registration for sale? Is a discount, yeah. If, if the listeners use the code FLOSS, um, it'll give them a 50% discount off their ticket price. Awesome, awesome specials for our audience. That's always nice. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's see, I think we're just about done, so and we're almost just out of time, so it's a good thing to do. So we'll see you again next week on Floss Weekly.